According to the Guinness Book of World Records, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the most translated document in history. But 60 years after coming into force, atrocities continue to occur. Is human rights a lost cause or a vital beacon of hope? Next on Great Decisions. In a democracy, agreement is not essential, but participation is. Join us as we discuss today's most critical global issues. Join us for Great Decisions. Great Decisions is produced by the Foreign Policy Association, inspiring Americans to learn more about the world. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by the Star Foundation. Great Decisions is produced in association with the University of Delaware. In Sudan's Darfur region, people are still subject to a genocidal campaign, by most accounts run by the central government in Khartoum. In China, in the days leading up to the 2008 Olympics, Beijing jailed and beat protesters who disagreed with government policy. And in the U.S., we're debating the use of torture as an anti-terrorism tool. Abu Ghraib and others are a reminder that we are not infallible. Um, and, but what we do try to do is when attention is drawn to these issues, we try to uh, make sure there is accountability. We try to correct our mistakes. When the U.N. authored the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, its goal was to establish these rights for everyone, not just for citizens of countries that already guaranteed them. But how does a signed piece of paper translate into real protection for real people? The challenge then and today is enforcement. The first area of guarding against human rights abuses is really uh, at the local level among defenders or human rights heroes in their own country, helped almost uh, in invariably by Human Rights Watch and by Amnesty International, by the Carter Center and other human rights organizations that are non-governmental in nature. The decades after the signing of the Human Rights Declaration have been no less bloody and oppressive than the years before. The killing fields of Cambodia, death squads in Latin America, political repression in the former Soviet Union, violence against women in the Middle East and Africa. We need to look beyond the, just turning to the, hum, uh, the Human Rights Council or to the United Nations when there's a human rights problem. It, because the UN is not very capable of overcoming that kind of built-in resistance of the membership. What are the consequences for human rights violators? Are sanctions and public condemnation enough? And in fighting terrorism, are countries like the United States sacrificing core human rights values for security? What about non-governmental organizations? Can groups like Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch really stop abuses or just document them? Never again, again and again, coming up next on Great Decisions. And now from our studios, here is Ralph Begleiter. Welcome to Great Decisions. I'm Ralph Begleiter. Joining us to discuss the state of human rights around the globe are Kenneth Roth, president of Human Rights Watch, and Hurst Hannum, professor of international law at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Thank you both for being with us, gentlemen. So the Declaration of Human Rights has been in around for six decades, and the United Nations has intervened over that course of time as well. Give us a sense of how you would evaluate how the performance of those institutions has been for protecting human rights around the world. Ken? Well, first of all, I think it's important to remember that the defense of human rights has mostly to do with, with actors outside of the United Nations. There's a very active non-governmental movement that has emerged over the years. And in fact, in almost every country around the world today, you find local human rights activists who are fighting to defend rights in their country. Um, the progress we've made is that today, it's impossible for a government to claim that it doesn't care about human rights. Even the worst dictators, even Saddam Hussein, pretended that he respected human rights and tried to hide his atrocities. Um, so that gives us real power to try to force governments to live up to their pretense, to bring their practice in lines with, with, with these principles that they claim to uphold. Now, the UN is, is a part of that process, but, but a fairly small part. I think its most important dimension are, say, the peacekeepers who will go and stop the killing or try to stop the killing in eastern Congo or Darfur. Um, there are also, say, the leaders, the Secretary General of the United Nations or the High Commissioner for Human Rights, who can use the bully pulpit, pulpit to try to shame abusers. And then you have political bodies like the UN Human Rights Council, which, which tend to perform less effectively. Hurst Hannum, do you think uh, government's role has been is accurately ca characterized there? Yes, I think so. And it is important to remember that human rights is not about 
creating a world order that's enforced by the UN. It really is about persuading governments to change. And I think sometimes we miss that because we need the United Nations and the international institutions as guardians, as watchdogs, as occasionally interveners. But essentially the history of human rights has been about bringing countries on board, first getting them to make a theoretical commitment to these standards, and then slowly, country by country, using the NGOs that uh, Ken talked about and using the UN where we can, getting them to act on these principles. And I think one of the unfortunate things that has happened over the last 10 or 15 years particularly is there's a much greater expectation on the part of many people that international organizations of the UN can somehow come in and themselves enforce or create human rights. It just can't be done. It's a much longer process than that. But we certainly have made progress uh, between now and uh, back in 1948. Having said that, the United Nations recently changed, in the last couple of years, changed its procedure for handling, switching from a 50-member United Nations Commission on Human Rights to a 47-member Council on Human Rights. We talked at Great Decisions with a number of human rights experts about the UN role. Let's hear what they had to say. So what have we seen from the Council? You've seen minor uh, resolutions mildly criticizing Sudan for the situation in Darfur, not even criticizing the government, just remarking on the situation, mildly rebuking Burma for its uh, crackdown on peaceful protesters and Buddhist monks. You have not seen any resolutions on China. You have not seen any resolutions on North Korea. No resolutions on Zimbabwe. No resolutions on Cuba. No resolutions on Saudi Arabia. No resolutions on Iran. You essentially have uh, old wine and new bottles. We've been very disappointed with the what seems to us to be an obsession with one country, Israel, where there have been a number of resolutions passed in efforts to uh, constantly bash Israel while ignoring problems elsewhere in the world. And so we have decided that our best approach is to uh, disengage from the Human Rights Council. Well, the United Nations is the foundation uh, or the center of the uh, global effort to enforce the 1948 uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, what the Court of Center has done is to try to make sure that those who are nominated and elected to the Council have some adequate credentials as human rights defenders and not really gross human rights oppressors. So we'll continue to do our work at the Court of Center, and I hope all the rest of the people in the world that are interested in human rights will do their best to cooperate with the United Nations whenever possible, to criticize the shortcomings, and to try to continue to improve the um, the integrity and the adequate function of the United Nations Council on Human Rights. Now, both of you have said that the UN is only a small part of the enforcement mechanism, and we heard uh, David Kramer of the State Department say the U.S. is just going to disengage from the Council. In effect, does that mean the UN is useless on this issue, or is there anything the UN can and a role the UN can and should play? Well, no, I think there's, there are very important roles for the UN to play. I mean, as I mentioned, probably the most important is peacekeeping, which has nothing to do with this politicized council that was just referred to. Um, there also is the possibility of shaming governments through the, the secretariat, um, Ban Ki-moon, the, the current secretary general, um, or, or um, Navi Pillay, the current high commissioner for human rights. But the political bodies, initially the Human Rights Commission, now transformed into the Human Rights Council, has been problematic. Initially, it was sort of a victim of its own success. The, the stigma of being condemned by the commission was so powerful, governments were so eager to avoid it, that all the thugs of the world flocked to the commission as a way of trying to defeat its, its um, effective operation. To become members on to it. To become members. And, and that um, is, is, in a sense, the situation we still have today, where the dictators outnumber those who are committed to defending human rights. Now, this new council is an improvement in certain respects. Um, it meets regularly rather than just once a year. Um, it actually reviews every government of the world, not just a selective few. Um, so there are certain steps in the right direction. And indeed, there's a new selection process where some of the worst offenders have been scared off or defeated in the election. That said, um, the, the bad guys have a majority. And the fact that the U.S. government has basically surrendered without a fight, it has not even joined the council, it has not been willing to use this diplomatic cl clout to try to make the council effective, has become a self-fulfilling prophecy. It should be in there fighting, um, bringing over some of the swing votes that are winnable, and that's how you make the council effective. Hurst, can I follow up on another aspect that we just heard in the clips, which was uh, that the reason the United States has disengaged, uh, according to Kramer, is that the UN Council and Commission before it have been overly critical in the U.S. view of the state of Israel. Is that a key issue to making the 
the, frankly, the UN and other mechanisms on human rights uh, more effective? Does that get in the way? Well, the UN is a political body, and it's never going to change. And it will identify, particularly when there's a majority, an easy majority to be found, what it considers to be the most egregious violations in the world and focus on those. We know that the situation in Palestine deserves all of the attention that's being focused on it. There's no doubt that it's disproportionate, that there are many terrible things happening all over the world. But let's think back a few years to the attention that was focused on apartheid in South Africa. That too was viewed by some as disproportionate. Yet over time, it gave support to activists both within South Africa and outside South Africa who ultimately did remove one of the two great stains uh, on the world, the system of apartheid. Unfortunately, the higher politics involving oil, involving domestic constituencies, et cetera, et cetera, in the Middle East have made the Middle East even less susceptible to the naming and shaming or to the spotlight that the UN has put on it. And we unfortunately haven't seen much progress in that area. So I think the criticisms are right, but they only go halfway. There is no country that is immune from criticism. And to pull out of the council as the US has done, to refuse to engage with it, simply because it focuses too much attention on a situation that does, after all, deserve attention, I think is a serious mistake. Ken, let me come back to something you said in your initial answer, which was that uh, non-governmental organizations, both of you talked about this, non-government organizations really have played uh, a major, major role in this issue of policing and identifying and calling out uh, human rights violations. Is that because governments can't or won't step up to the plate? Is it because uh, you have more credibility as an NGO than a government does? Well, what's interesting, 60 years ago, when government signed on to this Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I would suspect the vast majority thought that these were just words that would be meaningless. And, and it wasn't as if other governments were going to actively hold them to those principles, because they, too, were hoping to get away with a hypocritical response and just kind of ignore this document and put it away in the drawer. And so what has happened is a group of non-governmental organizations, Mine Human Rights Watch is one of many around the world, um, were created in order to hold governments to their promises. And in my view, governments are always tempted to violate human rights. It's always easy to, you know, to silence that pesky journalist or to, to get rid of the opposition figure and lock him up. And the role of, of these civil society organizations, really, you know, groups of members of the public banding together, is to generate pressure on governments to keep them honest, to hold them to those principles, and to force them to resist that temptation to violate human rights. But unfortunately, I think today, human rights is being increasingly conflated with social justice in various ways, with economic equality, with relations between rich and poor states, um, with international criminal law. All of these are quite different things. Mary Robinson, the former high commissioner uh, for human rights, who is one of the eminent spokespersons for human rights and someone whom I respect greatly, has recently said that climate change causes human rights violations. I simply don't know what that means. And I think there is a danger of human rights itself being caught up as a victim of its own success as it begins to add many more ornaments to this Christmas tree that has been fashioned by the efforts of Human Rights Watch and others. Let's zoom in for a couple of minutes on China because we do want to talk about that. And Hearst, you just came back from a couple of years in Hong Kong. Because of China's powerful economic position on the world stage, it presents particular challenges on the questions of human rights. Let's listen to what some of our experts had to say about China. China will uh, evolve and develop in its own unique way, but at the same time, there are certain fundamental freedoms common to all countries that respect human rights, such as freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, um, freedom of religion, that are very important. The Olympics led China to somewhat soften its stance. Now that the Olympics are done, that one leverage point has disappeared. And I expect China to continue to act as it has historically and be a, an impediment to advancing human rights. Well, exactly 30 years ago, I normalized diplomatic relations with China. There were practically non-existent uh, human rights of Chinese citizens. Uh, there was no uh, possibility of, uh, of earning a living except just under the state control. You have to look at human rights on a broad base. If you ask the average American citizen what is human rights, they would automatically say freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of, to elect my own uh, leaders, uh, freedom of assembly, those kind of things. They're all political rights, you might say. But other people in the developing world consider human rights to be the right of a person to have food to eat, a place to live, a chance to earn a uh, living, 
a chance to get an education, a chance for health care. So the social and economic and political rights are all legitimately to be considered as basic human rights. Until a country or a government or regime is able to uh, honor all the human rights, then they still are, are susceptible to and ought to be uh, criticized. Hearst Hannum, that's exactly the issue you were referring to a moment ago. Very much so. Do you think he's wrong? No, I think President Carter made a point that most people forget when talking about China. China has brought 200 or 300 million people out of abject, abject poverty. They had, at least until fairly recently, paid much more attention to education. Human rights don't accrue to a government automatically. China has ratified only one of the two major human rights covenants on economic, social, and cultural rights. It's not ratified the one on civil and political rights. The U.S. has done the reverse. China, I think, surprisingly, in my view, uh, cracked down on free expression and protest much more strongly than I expected in the last year or two. But China is still an extraordinarily complex place that it's impossible to predict where it's going to go. And I think, frankly, human rights groups are missing an opportunity because what they should be doing in China is to talk about those obligations that they've accepted, like the right to education, the right to food, the right to health care, all of which are being undermined in this race towards capitalism, and challenge China if they really believe that all human rights are equal and indivisible on those obligations without forgetting about torture and unfair trials and imprisonment of dissidents. Ken, we saw this come into really stark relief last year when the Olympics were underway and governments made decisions about whether to participate, not to participate. President Bush decided to go to Beijing. Does that illustrate the tension between uh, the kinds of things Hearst was just talking about? Yeah. Well, I, it's clear that it's very difficult to rely on powerful Western governments to use their clout vis-a-vis -vis China's human rights record, because they're all too eager to get the next contract or the next investment opportunity. Other interests play in more Other strongly. Other interests play in. And so, you know, whereas we would ordinarily say, go to Washington and say, you know, help us with, with Burma or help us with Zimbabwe, we can't get them effectively to help us with China because they're too interested in pursuing other goals. So, you know, that said, there is still much that can be done in China. I think when you assess the country, you have to recognize that there's been progress not only on the economic front, the way President um, Carter just referred to, but, but also just in terms of personal liberties. People are able to travel more freely, to choose their job, to choose where they'll live, to choose where they send their kids to school, all big things. But when it comes to the effort to speak out or to organize around political activities, to criticize the government, to form a labor union, to, to do a talk show like this one, um, to even do a blog, um, you can very quickly find yourself arrested. And, and there is a real need to put pressure on China, not simply because that's the right thing to do, that these are rights that even Chinese people deserve to have respected, but also, frankly, because it's the only way that China is going to solve its internal stability problem. The biggest problem facing Beijing today is instability at the local level caused by corrupt local officials. And it's too big a country for Beijing to just order these people to stop. It hasn't worked for years. They need to, in a sense, enlist local people power and let the local population speak out against the corrupt official, bring them to court, you know, write about them in the paper. And frankly, I think that that sort of self-interested argument made to Beijing is what will prevail over time, but there are risks involved. The United States, which has long been a champion of human rights, uh, finds itself in a situation where its reputation on that subject is a bit tarnished. Great decisions examined some of those uh, charges that the U.S. has undermined its credibility on human rights through policies and actions that it carried out in connection with the war on terrorism. Let's hear what some of our experts had to say on that subject. The very principles of human rights have been gutted when you say that an individual, um, by virtue of their nationality, can be deprived of their rights, and this idea is condoned by the United States. We are urging the next president to sign an executive order prohibiting torture, and the Congress must do something similar to ratify that decision. By not being a good model itself, both at home, the Patriot Act, and abroad, the Abu Ghraib and other words, and Guantanamo, they have lost their credibility. I don't want to come across as saying that the United States is perfect. We know what's best for everybody. Um, I want to admit right up front that, that we have our problems. We're trying to work through them. Um, and we hope that other countries will learn not only from our mistakes, but also from the good practices we have in place. The U.S. is head and shoulders above other countries in the world in terms of its observance and honor of the principles of human rights. The U.S. went through a judicial process to try and determine what it should do with Guantanamo. And that 
process ended up with a result that was against the policy of the administration. And so in the U.S., the system processed it, it worked, and we abide by the result of that. This is actually how it's supposed to work. Too many countries in the world don't have anything resembling that. The number one tool uh, in promoting human rights around the world is to set an example. There needs to be one major nation on Earth that unequivocally and permanently, with a deep commitment, honors every human right that's spelled out in a universal declaration. In the past, quite often, that has been the United States. And that needs to be restored under the next president. Hurst Hannum, your view about did the system work in the United States? Well, the system worked in a technical judicial sense, perhaps better than people expected. But the example set by the Bush administration over its eight years is one of the reasons why I think the state of human rights at its 60th anniversary in 2008 was in fact worse than as its 50th anniversary 10 years earlier. That combined with the rise in influence of Russia and China have contributed to a world, I think, where human rights is more politicized, uh, is less respected than before, partly because of this issue of example, but also partly because there's a tendency to expect everyone to interpret human rights in the same way. Human rights are universal, but they're not absolute. Almost every human right leaves room for limitations based on public morality or public order. And those are terms that can be abused, and they often are. But they also leave room for China or Indonesia or Kenya to interpret things a bit differently than the United States does, and for the US to insist, for instance, on a degree of freedom of expression that would be anathema in many other countries where hate speech is criminalized, and it's not here. The US needs to set an example, but it has to be one not of being the only country on the hill, but of a country around the hill that would like to have some friends. Uh, and it hasn't done that. The unilateralism has affected not only human rights, but international law generally. And it's going to take us a while to recover from that. Can your organization, Human Rights Watch, and the United States government and other organizations issue annual reports, and periodic ones as well, about human rights in various countries around the world? Have you found that your voice has been made less effective by the actions of the United States over the last decade or so? It doesn't harm my organization, but it does harm the movement. Because we have, um, really for two reasons. One, we've traditionally depended on the US government as a powerful voice for human rights. And second, the United States, as the world's most powerful government, is a powerful example. And let me give you just a sense of how this plays out. I was in Egypt a couple years ago, and I um, initially met with the US ambassador there. And I said, you know, are you still able to protest Egypt's pervasive torture and its pervasive detention of suspects without trial? And he had to admit sort of sheepishly, no, no, he couldn't possibly do that anymore. He has no credibility when the U.S. does the same thing back home. I then um, went and met with the Egyptian prime minister. And it was at a moment when Egypt was rounding up suspects and we knew they were being tortured. And I said, Mr. Prime Minister, why are you torturing these people? And without skipping a beat, he said, that's what Bush does. Now, that's a cheap answer. It doesn't justify it at all. But it allows him to deflect criticism and makes it easier for him to avoid the shaming that is often one of the best antidotes we have for government's temptations to violate human rights. That's a real loss for the movement. There's been a long tension, really decades worth of tension, over whether to use U.S. military force to engage in human rights corrections around the world. That was the case in Bosnia, it was the case in Somalia, it's been the case in the Middle East sometimes. Um, Ken, do you make the argument on Human Rights Watch that the United States, which has the military capability to do it, should be using that power uh, in support of human rights? Well, Human Rights Watch does at times advocate humanitarian intervention. We did it in the case of the genocide in Bosnia. We did it in the case of the genocide in Rwanda. There have been selective other cases where there is you know, mass murder going on and only military force will be capable of stopping it. So um, we're not a pacifist organization. We recognize there is a role for military force to sometimes stop mass atrocities. Now, it's best when that happens multilaterally because there's greater legitimacy in a multilateral military action than for one government to just go in on its own and claim to be supporting human rights, but it really is pursuing, say, an agenda of toppling Saddam or, or whatever the case might be. Um, one of the lessons, though, I think, of the last several years, certainly the, under the Bush administration, is that um, you frankly need the rest of the world to cooperate with you. You know, the problems facing the United States, whether it's fighting terrorism or, or, or many other things, require cooperation. And if um, 
if you are not subscribing to the international standards that most governments subscribe to, if you claim to be above the law, it's harder to enlist other governments in actions that are really you know, in your interest. And so the United States, powerful as it is, is not powerful enough to change the world on its own. It needs partners, and if it wants those partnerships, it has to be willing to play by the rules that everybody else does, which means respecting human rights, even in the face of major challenges like terrorism. Hurst Hannum, professor of international law at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, and Ken Roth, uh, president of Human Rights Watch in the United States. Thank you very much, both of you, for being with us on Great Decisions. And thank you as well for joining us on Great Decisions. We'll see you next time. I'm Ralph Begleiter. To learn more about topics discussed on Great Decisions, visit our website at www.greatdecisions.tv. To order a copy of the Great Decisions briefing book, a DVD set of this series, or join a Great Decisions discussion group in your area, contact the Foreign Policy Association. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by the Star Foundation. Great Decisions is produced in association with the University of Delaware. Next time on Great Decisions. Great Decisions travel to Cairo to see firsthand where U.S.-Egypt relations stand today. One thing we found is certain. Despite recent disagreements, Egypt remains a critical U.S. ally in the Arab world. Next time on Great Decisions.